So I'm delighted to kick off chairing the Saturday session. My name is George Follow. So I run the CLL and Lymphoma Programme in Cambridge and for the East of England. And we've got a great bunch of panellists today. And we're going to be talking you through in a nice, relaxed Saturday morning, three different topic areas. Uh, Ros Johnson, who's the CLL lead down at Brighton and the Brighton Medical School, is going to be starting off. And Ros is going to be presenting on a general introduction to CLL. Okay, thank you, George, um, for that introduction. And thank you, everyone, for joining this morning on um, what's quite a sunny morning down here. Um, I'm just going to go through a basic background uh, about CLL. It's some of these things you'll almost certainly know already. CLL is a, a low-grade blood cancer. It, it's a neoplasm of mature B cells, and it leads to um, a progressive accumulation of a, a clone of B lymphocytes. Uh, sometimes only in the marrow spilling out into the blood when we call it CLL and sometimes mostly in the glands when it's known as small lymphocytic lymphoma but the vast majority of patients have got a bit of both and the two diseases are biologically fairly identical and the names are used interchangeably. It's a common leukemia although not a common cancer and we are seeing it more often and in younger patients. And um, that's probably at least in part because of the, you know, how many more people have blood tests and investigations these days, especially in their elder years. It's a little bit more common in men and there's some ethnic variability. And in general, it, it's a disease of older people. Um, and there is, as with many, uh, blood cancer is a, a small family association, but that's not something that we see commonly. What we do know is that um, much more commonly in about five to 10% of the over 60s, if we look, we can see a clone of B cells at a low level. And um, we, we can find it and there's a defined number of less than five times 10 to the nine per liter, but there's no lymphadenopathy or any other features of, of a cancer. The, the causes for this are likely multifactorial and only about one to two percent of patients a year progress to actually have CLL or a, a lymphocyte kind of over five times 10 to nine per liter. And there are various risk factors for progression, which will be unsurprising when we go on to talk about the risk factors for more aggressive disease as well. And we'll go through those in more detail later in the talk. Um, the diagnosis is um, made by uh, finding a lymphocytosis in the peripheral blood, which is sustained and has a characteristic clonal immunophenotype. Um, there's the classical five point score that was used originally, um, developed at the Marsden. And there are various other markers such as CD200 and ROR1 that help us much more these days to refine the diagnosis when it's a bit more difficult. What does a CLL cell look like? Well, it has reduced levels of apoptosis due to overexpression of BCL2. It proliferates more and that's both by uh, through antigen stimulation, but also sort of auto stimulation where immunoglobulin molecules on adjacent B cells can interact and stimulate each other. It's also characterized by abnormal humoral and cellular and T cell immune responses to infection and vaccination and has characteristic chromosomal and genetic changes as well as our increasing awareness of changes in the microenvironment around the clonal B cells. One of the biggest distinctions in CLL is something that was uncovered in the 90s. And um, the group in Bournemouth looked at the immunoglobulin genes in patients with CLL. So this is the immunoglobulin heavy gene, um, which become, undergoes somatic hypermutation in the germinal center of B cells in response to antigen stimulation. So, CLL cells who have a mutated immunoglobulin have a slightly more um, narrow antigen specificity and they're, they're quieter, less aggressive. Those with an unmutated immunoglobulin gene have a, 
a sort of a rest earlier in their development before they enter the germinal center of the B cell. And those cells are more polyreactive and clinically more aggressive. CLLs often diagnosed incidentally when people have blood tests for another reason. Sometimes people feel a lump in their neck and um, often we might see CLL when patients have um, lymph node clearance for breast cancer or other biopsies done because CLL cells tend to home to sites of um, where things are happening in the body. As the disease progresses, people can have quite disabling B symptoms such as weight loss and sweat. And as the CLL clone takes up more space in the marrow, it leaves less room for normal blood. So patients develop anemia and thrombocytopenia. We have some patients who present, certainly we had patients in COVID who presented with severe COVID and were found to have CLL in the background as a first presentation. And patients can also develop autoimmune uh, problems particularly ITP or autoimmune hemolytic anemia. CLL cells look pretty characteristic under the microscope. They have a mature clumped chromatin pattern that you can see on the left. And characteristically, there are lots of smear cells or smudge cells because the cells are quite fragile as the smear is spread. And we use a flow cytometer to um, find a CD5 and 23 positive phenotype, which is pretty unique to CLL. Characteristically, their CD20 expression is lower than normal B cells, which can also help. When you see someone for the first time, um, we kind of do a, we want to confirm the diagnosis with immunophenotyping. But if people have a low level lymphocytosis and are otherwise asymptomatic, we don't necessarily go on at that stage to uh, genetically profile their disease in terms of their cytogenetics, their immunoglobulin gene status, and the molecular characteristics of their CLL. I mean, we can talk about that afterwards. I certainly reserve that for patients that I see who have disease that is changing and moving when I review them or patients who come to me with disease that's clearly going to need treatment imminently. Not all patients even need uh, cross-sectional imaging. So if patients are asymptomatic, the international guidelines are that there's no, and, and have a normal clinical examination, there's no ne necessity to do a CT. And we do use PET scans in in CLL, they can be useful to look for areas of high grade transformation. Historically, patients had bone marrows and the, the degree of bone marrow infiltration and, and how it was infiltrated was a prognostic factor. But in practice these days, it's pretty rare to need to do one unless we're unclear about the cause of a cytopenia. And patients sometimes have a lymph node biopsy to confirm the diagnosis. Or more commonly, perhaps if we're concerned that their disease may have transformed to something more aggressive. We have a couple of different staging systems for um, CLL, which are both um, quite well established and just reflect kind of the burden of disease as it increases. But I think it's fair to say that the staging of CLL is, is probably less useful clinically than in other lymphomas. The, a lot of patients, uh, so when we see people for the first time, if, if their white count is low, some of them may never progress to need any treatment. Some of them will progress fairly quickly and then the remainder will go on to kind of watchful waiting, which is, um, you know, uh, where we kind of keep an eye on things, see if things are changing. Uh, and what are we watching for? So we're in terms of what we look for as doctors, we're kind of looking for any evidence of anemia, we're looking for increasing lymph node burden, we're looking to see how quickly the white cell is, cells are changing. So we know that if your disease is doubling in less than a year, that puts you into a, a group who's much more likely to need treatment for their CLL. Making patients aware of their skin and reminding of that is important because there's an increased incidence, particularly of non-melanoma skin cancers. 
And because this is a disease that you're going to live with for a long time, hopefully, it's important to make sure that patients are looking after the rest of their organ systems as well. And particularly in light of some of the new drugs that we use, it's cardiac health is important. When I see my patient in clinic, I want to know if they've lost any weight unexpectedly, um, if they're having sweats at night. And we all know a good history of kind of night sweats related to lymphomas where patients are waking up kind of drenched and having to change their night clothes and sheets. Some patients with CLL are really concerned about the cosmetic appearance of nose, particularly in the neck, um, and they can be uncomfortable and awkward. Patients can have disabling fatigue as well, which um, particularly at relapse can be a reason why people really want some more treatment because they remember from before that when their CLL was treated, that symptom really improved. So I think just quickly from the patient's point of view, it's really important to make some time for a decent discussion in clinic, if you can, however pressurized that is, when patients are first diagnosed, make sure they've got contacts for their CNS and that they're aware of local support groups and the sort of wealth of online information um, that's available now for um, patients who are on watch and wait or, or going to be treated. And I think one of the great things about looking after patients with CLL is that you normally have a period, a, a significant period of time to, to help someone become an expert in their own disorder before they need treatment so that they can really be involved in the treatment decisions and, and what the pros and cons are of the various possibilities. Um, when I first did this talk, I asked some of my um, kind of long long standing patients about what their time on watch was and weight was like and and i was actually really surprised because these are some of my most um positive patients who have um you know stormed through treatment and get on with having um very busy and high quality lives despite their cll and its treatment but it's clear that that this period of time is really significant um for patients because um you're in this this kind of limbo of, of not being sure what's going to happen. So we, we don't necessarily have to follow everyone up in, in hospital, I think. Um, some areas have got quite sophisticated remote monitoring services and if someone clearly has CLL that's not really progressing and their white count is low, then I don't think there's any reason why they shouldn't be followed up elsewhere as long as they've had all the information and are aware of um, what's important. Um, I tend to see people reasonably regularly to start with and then uh, there are certain patients who are untreated that still only have blood counts once a year because things do tend to move quite gently and slowly and predictably. Um, we'll talk a little bit about what we can do in the watch and wait phase in terms of treatment in a bit and you know it's just as we said before educating patients about the things that are important apart from their CLL. So what, what alters your prognosis on watch and wait in terms of whether you're likely to need treatment? So obviously, uh, in terms of patient factors on the left, if, if you've got a more advanced stage or if your white cells are doubling quickly, you're much more likely to require treatment. And as I said, if, if you, they're doubling in less than a year, you're very likely to need treatment and doubling in less than six months is a reason to start. If we look at cell surface and, and sort of protein expression. So apart from the characteristic phenotype in CLL, we know that cells that express CD38 are more aggressive and more likely to move. And um, we've talked about the mutational status a little bit already. So an unmutated patient is more likely to have disease that needs treated. And I mean, these are just a selection of the abnormalities that that can be associated with progression because our knowledge of these is increasing all the time. <clears throat> we then go on to look at the cytogenetics. Um, so at the next level down, and we know that particularly patients with uh, deletion 17P or 11Q uh, <clears throat> are more likely to have aggressive disease. Patients with short telomeres are likely to have shorter responses to treatment. And any patient who has a, a complex uh, set of cytogenetics, 
So a number of abnormalities, either more than three or five. <clears throat> and we also know that some cytogenetic abnormalities predict for a disease that's more likely to be quiescent and a deletion of chromosome 13Q is one of those. And now in 2023, we're in the incredible situation where we can look at individual patients, uh, gene sequences, and um, again, any change in the P53 gene is a very important prognostic factor, but our knowledge of what's important in this area is increasing all the time. So we know that uh, NOTCH1 and SF3B1 are important, and we've got recent data from the UK on whole genome sequencing in, in series of trial CLL patients. So I just thought it's interesting to look at genetic prognosis in CLL. This is um, a study from 1999 in blood, which uh, first looked at the prognostic impact of whether your um, immunoglobulin gene was mutated or unmutated. And you can see the impact on overall survival in that curve, which is quite dramatic. And then still in 2022, this is from Anna Stu's paper in Nature last year, we can identify patients with different genetic signatures and combinations of abnormalities that put them into different prognostic groups. So we are, you know, what I'm hoping is that, you know, in 2023, we're using that immunoglobulin status to help us make treatment decisions. And so we've got to be hopeful that as we go forward, our increasing knowledge of all these genetic abnormalities will help to influence and develop treatments in the future. And as you can see, um, on the gray lines that having um, P53 altered is still the most important prognostic factor. Um, again, there's um, sort of prognostic indexes that we can use to pre predict five and 10 year overall survival. I have to say personally, I don't really regularly use these myself with my patients, but it'd be interesting to see if other people do. And we have a set of um, sort of fully defined treatment indications from the uh, International Workshop on CLL, but essentially evidence of marrow failure, massive splenomegaly, symptomatic or very big lymphadenopathy, <clears throat> autoimmune complications, and um, significant fatigue, weight loss, sweats. We've talked about these before. So taking a step back before we talk about treatment, just to lead into what we use to treat CLL, um, B cells from who, that are CLL B cells require interactions with non-malignant cells and the cell matrix and microenvironment to survive and grow. And those signals are mediated through the B cell receptor and integrins. And so, that leads to activation of um, Bruton kinase, which prevents cell death, promotes activation and growth, and allows cells to return to their anatomical sites for rescue signals to continue to grow. And when we inhibit Bruton kinase, that alters all of these signals. So the cells kind of then are, they're, they're their signals that are telling them to proliferate and grow are switched off, a bit like switching off the uh, power to an electric light bulb, and that indirectly leads to cell death. Whereas when we use, uh, we talked about BCL2 being a pro-apoptotic inhibitor, uh, a pro-apoptotic protein, and the other drug that we're commonly using is a BCL2 inhibitor, that allows apoptosis to restart. So BCL2 inhibition leads directly to cell death, as opposed to BTK inhibition, which leads indirectly to cell death. As you know, we also use monoclonal antibodies in CLL. Um, we've got two commonly used anti-CD20 monoclonals, rituximab and abinutuzumab. Does it matter which one we use? Um, they work in slightly different ways. Abinutuzumab is a type 2 monoclonal anti-CD20, and it also has direct sort of cytotoxic effects, as well as just stimulating complements. 
and it's also probably given in a bigger dose. And we know definitively from the CLL11 trial, which was done in Germany a few years ago, that if you give an old fashioned chemotherapy um, reagent chlorambucil, if you give it with rituximab versus abinutuzumab, that patients with abinutuzumab have a, a improved progression free survival. So we think that abinutuzumab is a much better antibody in CLL. The other question which is interesting is if, if we identify patients that we think are at risk of progression, if we treat them early, does it help? And the Germans have actually addressed this question. So what they did was look at patients who had features that were higher risk. So they looked at a big cohort, any patient who had abnormalities of uh, the P53 gene or who had an unmutated immunoglobulin gene or deletion 11Q uh, were randomized between treatment with ibrutinib and placebo. And this trial is a really interesting lesson in kind of trial design and what we look at and what we measure in not only CLL, but a range of kind of low grade blood disorders. So if we look at um, the event free survival, um, obviously patients on ibrutinib are, um, are having a significantly better um, period of time without symptoms <clears throat> with a, a fantastic probability value of less than 0 0.001. And um, again, their progression-free survival is even more dramatic. So if you start on ibrutinib early, then it's probably not hugely surprising that um, you know, your, your progression is vastly altered. So you know, looking at these fantastic curves, do we think that everyone should be treated with ibrutinib before they have symptoms if they've got high-risk features? If you look at the overall survival, in, that, in this uh, cohort, you can see that there's absolutely no difference between the two groups. The death rates look similar between ibrutinib and placebo, but you can see that in the ibrutinib group, you've got four out of 182 patients who've died from side effects related to the drug almost certainly. Slightly lower rate potentially of second malignancies in the abrutinib group, but that's not borne out in other trials. So I think we can safely say from, from that that there's absolutely no evidence that treating high-risk patients early is helpful. So what are the first-line treatments that we have in 2023? So I think what I say to my patients is that we're incredibly lucky because the treatments that we've got now are both gentle and effective. And really, there's a very limited role, if any, for chemoimmunotherapy <clears throat> in the UK where we have access to these new targeted agents. And that may not be the case where, where, if you're working outside the UK. We've got our BCSH guidelines, which are probably going to be under review very soon, even though they've only just come out because things are moving so fast. And I've done a, a different summary uh, slide for what's available at the minute. So I think one of the interesting things is that we've got this historical differentiation in CLL between patients who are, in inverted commas, fit versus patients who are less fit. And that um, can be over the age of 65 being considered less fit or over the age of 70 or younger patients who have comorbidities. <clears throat> and that was relevant when we were using uh, chemoimmunotherapy like FCR um, which had a significant side effect profile and was difficult to deliver to therapeutic benefit uh, in terms of risk benefit ratios in older patients. So the toxicities associated with the, the regime were so significant that they were hard to deliver. Now that we've got very effective targeted agents, I think we're getting to a point where you could argue that that differentiation between fit and less fit is much less relevant but it still exists at the minute and it still exists for us as clinicians in terms of the drugs that we can choose. So in, um, in the upfront situation, the BTK inhibitors currently are given continuously. So you start to take them and continue to take them un until you progress. And um, if you have uh, no disruption in your P53 gene and you are less than 65 and otherwise fit, 
then strictly speaking, you have no access to your BTK inhibitor at the moment. If you're less fit, you can access acalabrutinib, and all patients can now access venetoclax plus abinutuzumab, and since very recently, venetoclax plus abrutinib. And having a disrupted P53 gene does buy you access to acalabrutinib up front, as well as abrutinib in, in all patients. So why, why don't we use chemoimmunotherapy? So um, I think there are, there are several reasons, um, not least because several trials have shown that um, the new or targeted agents are more effective than both FCR and BR in, in the upfront setting. So um, we have data from our FLARE trial and data, this is data from the E1912 trial which both showed um, better progression-free survival um, in patients with uh, the newer agent compared with historical chemotherapy. And the Alliance trial did the same for bendamustine and rituximab. Um, <clears throat> and well, secondly, the other, um, the other issue is sort of side effects with FCR, which are not just time limited to the delivery of the chemotherapy. So when we were using FCR, um, there are certainly a subset of patients who have very prolonged cytopenias afterwards that can lead to infectious problems. But the most sort of sinister long-term effect is the, the risk of sort of MDS and AML. So up to about one in five patients who've received FCR will de develop a secondary blood cancer, which would be, um, you know, a, a terminal illness. Um, and in the, in the era of where, we've, where we can access drugs that are both more effective and less toxic and the short, in the short and long term, it's very difficult to make an argument for continuing to use those drugs. So how effective are the two options that we've got? I'll go through these quickly and then Helen and Piers, I know we'll be dealing with things in more detail. So um, the Elevate TN trial um, evaluated acalabrutinib compared to abinutizumab and chloramicil in older patients. And what we can see is that the acalabrutinib in this trial was given um, with and without abinutizumab. So the, the top uh, curve in the kind of marine color is with abinutizumab, which looks, um, which looks better perhaps, but is offset by an increased risk of infection in that arm. And in the UK, on the NHS, we can't use the acalabrutinib with abinutizumab. So in the UK, um, we can only use it single agent, which is the green curve. And as you can see, there's an excellent progression-free survival advantage over clamsin and abinutizumab, which isn't borne out in terms of any overall survival advantage at five years. Um, and then this is the trial which led to us using um, venetoclax and abinutizumab. So um, again, venetoclax and abinutizumab compared to chlorambucil abinutizumab, again, in patients who are slightly older or less fit. And again, quite a long follow-up in this trial now. Um, these are six-year results. And as you can see, there's a maintained progression-free survival advantage for patients treated with venetoclax and abinutizumab. And also, a, a kind of small overall survival advantage now for those patients as well, which is um, interesting and exciting. So which is best? So we, we can choose a long-term BTK inhibitor or venetoclax and nabinatizumab, which is time limited and given for a year. So venetoclax and nabinatizumab is there's no doubt it's a, probably a bit of a pain over the first few weeks. There's lots of visits back and forward for um, multiple antibody infusions and blood tests as we uh, ramp up the venetoclax week by week. We start at a low dose. Um, the abinutizumab can give you quite unpleasant side effects. And obviously we're all aware of tumor lysis with venetoclax. But actually once those first few weeks are, um, are over, apart from um, mild neutropenia, which is often easy to manage, venetoclax is associated really with very few side effects in the long term, and it's very well tolerated. And after a year, your patient can be off treatment, 
and um, if they're in a, a good molecular remission at that point are likely to have a significant periods of time um, before they need any other therapy. The BTK inhibitors, in this case in the UK, acalabrutinib, incredibly easy to start. So you hand over your tablets, patients go home and take them. It's great if it's difficult for patients to travel to hospital. Um, the side effect profile is really um, very good. Um, there are obvious, uh, there are still concerns about um, cardiac and bleeding issues with acalabrutinib, but they're much better than um, with abrutinib previously. I'll show you a slide on that at the moment. And, um, you know, people feel well on it quite quickly. <clears throat> And at the minute, as I say, we continue to take uh, these drugs for as long as disease responds, but we're looking at whether if patients are responding well, whether it's possible to stop those after a period of time, and peers will talk a little bit about that as well. Just a little bit about relapse quickly. So the optimal sequence of sequencing of drugs is, is yet to be defined. That's what we're kind of learning now with these new medications. But at the minute, if you, um, if you have had venetoclax and abinutuzumab as your upfront treatment, and you've had a good response to that, there is actually some limited evidence to support trying venetoclax again. But of course, you could also switch to BTKI, and we know that you'll have a good response to that. <clears throat> if you've been on a BTKI long term and progress, then the majority of patients have developed some kind of resistance mutation on that. And so uh, patients in general switch to venetoclax-based treatment at that point, either time limited for two years with rituximab or continuous therapy as a single agent. And um, we're still able to, to access PI3 kinase inhibitors, but we use those much less now, idlalazib, um, because of a sort of less favorable side effect profile that they've had. Um, so this slide just shows um, a trial in relapse between comparing, we, we don't have many trials comparing different BTK inhibitors, but this trial compared um, acalabrutinib with abrutinib in the relapse setting. And I think the important thing to notice is the, um, the difference in instance of hypertension and atrial fibrillation at the bottom between the two drugs. So second generation BTK inhibitors such as acalabrutinib and zanabrutinib, which Helen will talk a little bit about as well, are, have, have less um, off-target effects in terms of cardiac side effects and bleeding, and um, therefore may be better, especially for patients who have got cardiac issues in the background. So in summary, what do, I, um, what do I want you to take away from today? So um, I didn't really talk about this much and it will be talked about tomorrow as well, but even in those patients with the low levels of lymphocytosis, remember vaccination. I've taken my slides out because Helen's going to cover that, but it's important. And, you know, we're in this, in a, this amazing uh, era where this elucidation of B-cell biology and genomics has led to these incredibly effective targeted treatments. And the genomic information that we have now really lets us have very personalized conversations with our patients about what their risk factors are, how their disease is likely to behave, and hopefully how they'll respond to medication as we go forward. It, you know, the Germans have answered very clearly that there's no rule for treating asymptomatic patients even when they're high risk. And I hope I've convinced you that there's a limited or no rule for chemoimmunotherapy if you can access targeted agents. Um, and, you know, the sequencing and long-term side effects uh, of all these medications is a work in progress. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Roz, thank you very much. That was a tour de force. CLL and perfectly bang on time at 20 to 10. Roz, you brought up so many areas of discussion there from 
the stresses of watch and wait, to the discussions we have with our patients about molecular profiling. Uh, I love the CLL12 trial. It raises a lot of questions, um, and but also gives us quite a few important answers in the era of modern therapies. And then you linked into how we're actually treating CLL. But of course, Helen and Piers are gonna talk more about therapy. So I think we'll park those points. So I'm going to kick off with the molecular profiling of an early stage watch and wait patient. In the last couple of weeks, I've had two good examples of this from different extremes where um, a good educational one for me was a husband and wife partnership where there's clearly a difference of opinion as to what should be done in terms of molecular profiling. Um, and I must admit, nowadays, I do allow it to be done after a time of reflection. That sounds very paternalistic, doesn't it? But I think it's it's a difficult one because every time we do tests in medicine, we, we and the patients are always hoping we're gonna get good results. But there's a lot of psychological stress about watch and wait. And if you go and find your unmutated IGHB or you've got a 17P or a small TP53 mutated clone, it creates a bit of stress. So Ros, talk me through how you engage that discussion with patients? Are you permissive if they want the testing? Well, I think um, in the very early stage patients, I, I tend to not, if I see someone who's very early stage and older, then I may not even discuss it because um, Whatever your risk profile, if you are in your late 70s or 80s, um, you can probably start on, I would do it before I treated them, whatever. But in terms of discussions before that, even if they had a high risk profile and they're late 70s, early 80s, if they start on a BTK inhibitor, the chances are that that BTK inhibitor will, will be adequate for them within their lifetime. So I think it's in that situation, it becomes less important in a way. But if you have a younger patient, even with a lower white cell count, so, you know, I recently I've had, you know, patients in their thirties and forties, then actually, even if you've got a low count, I kind of think that is helpful to genomically profile them as much as anything. You know, if if they have any high risk features, I'm not going to dis discharge them to their GPs with their with their white cell lymph like kind of 10 or 15. I think those patients should stay in the clinic. OK, so you raise an interesting point there about possibly influencing a follow up strategy. Let me bring Lelia in, because obviously it's a patient perspective issue. This is quite a challenging one. Lelia, what, what are your thoughts? What feedback do you get from the patient groups on this topic? Um, yeah, I mean, I think my first reflection would be that term watch and wait, because amongst the most people refer to it as watch and worry. Um, so it's not a popular term period um, in the community of people with CLL. Um, and I think I would agree. I think there's lots of different, there's a huge spectrum. Some people prefer not to know because they don't, they don't want to get to grips with the un understanding what it would all mean but other people absolutely do. Um, and another thing I like to bring into the discussion from a patient perspective is I really struggle with, and I think a lot of people do with this, that, well, first of all, the first thing is being told you've got a cancer and we're not gonna treat you is really hard to get your head around. Personally, I took two weeks off work just to come to terms with that. Um, and I'd never taken a day off work in my entire life thereafter. And I didn't when I got chemo. Um, so it, it knocked me off work for two weeks, whereas chemo didn't. Um, and the other part of it is what does no symptoms mean? Because that's it's not a binary thing. So it's a judgment made by the haematologists, not by the patients. And mm -hmm. most, myself included, a lot of us feel, actually, we have got symptoms and you're telling us we haven't. And I think one thing that that ten, can do is undermine confidence that you're being listened to which has a much longer term consequence than knowing what your genes are. So um, Lily, you bring up some important points. I'm actually going to link in directly to the questions because thank you, we're getting them coming in. And a question exactly on that point. I often find patients got low level B symptoms, sometimes an itch, sweat, bit of fatigue. How, how do you measure them? How do you quantify? Because I guess, Lily, that's the point you're raising is 
the patient knows their body better than we do. And we commonly have that discussion and say, look, I'm telling you, I'm more tired than I used to be. Yeah. I think if, if we as clinicians dismiss it, that can cause undermined confidence, can't it? Absolutely. And fatigue is something that CLL causes, the treatment causes. As my consultant used to tell me, my first consultant said, well, you're also getting older, Lelia. Um, so it's very hard and it's insidious. So it's very hard day by day to say that it's significantly worse. And I think age is a factor. I was diagnosed at 51. Um, and if you're used to judging, you know, fatigue in people who are in their 70s and 80s, you know, I, I was a, I had a busy professional life. I had young children from the taking a history. I probably sounded like I was really active, but I was struggled for years with fatigue that just. So I was relieved when I was finally told I needed treatment. But, you know, I was told I was asymptomatic and I wasn't. So Lily, let me, let me link back into, I'm going to link back into some clinicians now, because yeah. Helen, let, let me pick on you that the, the intervening, so we, we've covered off the molecular genetics. I think, I think all of us are relatively permissive. We used to be pretty strict that they weren't offered, but I think particularly younger patient who says, look, I need to know for myself and I accept they may be good, may be bad, but I just need to know. I think we're going to say that's okay. But Helen, the fatigue side, do do you? And I'm going to give you a sort of warning shot I had recently on this one. Uh, do do you ever take to a patient with early stage, and they just and after you know a few consultations, the fatigue? Do you just say, okay, I'm going to treat you, even though your lymphocyte count's only twelve? I think I would. I, I absolutely take Lilia's point, and that's that's really interesting what she said. But patients being told they they don't have symptoms. I don't think we say to patients' face, you don't have symptoms. But I guess probably we write it in a letter, don't we? In a sort of I saw so and so today, and they're asymptomatic, and on we go. Um, so the fatigue side of things, I think what, what I would be saying to the patient is, I can hear you have fatigue. My worry is if I give you treatment for CLL, am I actually going to make the fatigue better? Um, and I think that's a bit of an unknown. Um, and then there's always the possibility that by giving you treatment for CLL, I may not make it better and I might introduce some other problems instead. Um, some other potential side effects or, or or other complications to your to your life and your lifestyle in terms of trips into hospital for phonetic acts or whatever it is. So I think if I had a patient who was recurrently coming back and saying, look, this is a really big deal and this is interfering with my quality of life, then obviously I'm going to hear that and say, OK, well, maybe we need to talk about treatment for that reason. But in the absence of any other indications for treatment um, in terms of uh drenching night sweats or weight loss or um, you know in, enlarging lymph nodes or cytopenias if I didn't have any other really hard measurable um, indications of treatment I would be really counseling the patient really carefully about that and to be quite honest I can't think of a single patient I've ever started on treatment just for fatigue. Okay so I'm going to, I'm going to throw in my learning lesson from the clinic a few months ago actually time passes might be a year or two ago the <laughs> chap who we'd had these endless discussions about fatigue and uh, he'd come up and I'd just, because we've got to be honest, with the newer therapies, it's not quite like FCR. I mean, com I completely get the argument, starting somewhere on FCR or BR for fatigue seems counterintuitive. But we also know you can pop someone on acalabrutinib and within a month or two, they come into the clinic and say, I feel great. And so <laughs> it is slightly, I find it harder in this day and age because, you know, if you're 75 and you no longer play golf because of your fatigue and you have a tablet you can give them, um, and they will feel better. Yeah, you know, what are you saving yourself for at 75? Strangely enough, I've, 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 I find I've had a lower threshold for a bit older than younger. Younger, you've got a 20, 30 year. But I'll tell you my learning lesson. I had a guy lined up, multiple conversations about fatigue, and he came in, we were going to sign the consent, and off we go. And he came out, I said, oh, you're looking brighter today. And he says, oh, yeah, so much better since the GP sorted out my diabetes. And I went, oh. <laughs> Uh, quickly checked HbA1c oh my goodness and so it is a reminder and I know we all know that we're all general medically trained and of course we check HbA1c's and thyroid function and uh, but um, anyway I, I'm going to bring in Piers next but Leila do you have any comments on what Helen said about the fatigue? Yeah and I'm to clarify I wasn't really trying to push to treat purely for fatigue it's it's more a general thing about feeling listened to, I think. And maybe change, you don't, you're quite right. I'm sure nobody sits and says, no, you haven't got symptoms. But it's the language of, we'll treat we when, you're, when you've got symptoms. That's how it feels. 
So maybe I'm arguing for a, slightly, a slight change in language yeah. and not saying, well, treat when you've got symptoms, but it's a more nuanced. A more nuanced. And, and, and fatigue is something you have to take the person's judgment on because you can't measure it. So, um, Lily, I'm going, to move, I'm going to move on to Piers. I'm just going to put one observational comment before I forget, because I know I'm also going to address some of these questions in the chat. I think you gave that wonderful summary of the psychological stress of diagnosis versus chemo. Two weeks off work for diagnostic stress, no time off work for FCRB or whatever you were treated with. And it, that is quite a, a, a strong reminder. And I often say to my patients, no matter how switched on you are how pragmatic a thinker you are it takes three four five months to get over this concept that suddenly you know people like us you have an oncology nurse you come up to a clinic and I describe it often as like surfing waves and some days you're going to feel you're getting your head around it and then you'll crash down and you'll be hit by a wave and to sort of expect this and it takes quite a lot of time I think um, a lot of us as clinicians sometimes forget we might be fit and well don't have a, a chronic disorder but I think being told you have a chronic disorder which cannot be treated whether it's multiple sclerosis CLL autoimmune disease I mean you, you can imagine it can really impact on how a patient perceives themselves and their relationship with people. I absolutely agree and just I think the first thing most people hear is the only one word and that's leukemia nobody hears the chronic yeah no, that's it, well, partly that's what takes you time to get a lot of time to get your head round. But the first word that everybody hears is leukemia. And Lily, actually, before sorry, Piers, are you coming? In? <laughs> my, my, the love. My, I also more recently, I've started to say to people, just be cautious about who you tell this diagnosis. You've got this diagnosis for the first few weeks, because I think with this, in the modern era of. Um, your Twitter tweeting, Facebook, the, the temptation for patients is to leave your clinic room and put it on all of their social media things. And I've had quite a few patients recently come back to me saying the one thing they regret is telling everyone, because when you get your head around early stage CLL, you don't want to, the first thing the vicar says to you in church or the, your landlord says to you, but the first thing is, oh, how are you? With that sort of tilted head, I feel sorry for you, look. Because but, CLL patients are themselves, they're not a disease. And co I absolutely agree that COVID blew that apart. So for a lot of people on Watch and Wait, they suddenly found they had to tell everybody. Yeah, I know you raised And that. even now you have to explain why you don't want to do certain things with your friends. Yeah, yeah, no, no, good point. Good point. I completely agree with you, but, but unfortunately the world has changed. Right, Piers, talking of changing worlds, I'm going to push you on bone marrow biopsies and CT scans. So... <laughs> We, the four clinician panel members, we're all selected because we're running CLL programs in a different part of the country. And we don't do, I'm sure we don't do very few bone marrow biopsies. That is not true across the country. And a lot of our colleagues working in district hospitals still love a bone marrow and the description of the interstitial extensive replacement. That, God, it, before we do CTs, tell me about your views on bone marrow biopsies. Well, you don't need them unless you, <laughs> having said that, most of my patients, because so many of them are on studies, <laughs> if they're on treatment, will have had multiple bone marrow. So, I mean, it's the classic ivory tower CLL practice. Oh, I don't do genomic testing, but it's actually everyone is fully profiled. I don't do bone marrow, but actually everyone's got a bone marrow. But they don't, I don't find them helpful unless, of course, there's another reason that you're looking for a cytopenia and you can't explain things. They're much more helpful on treatment, and we can discuss that at another time. But pre-treatment, there's no role for them, certainly not for the genomics. It just delays things. I'd much rather my colleagues did do the genomic profiling, and we could discuss that on the blood in a timely manner before starting treatment than waiting for that bone marrow, which you don't need to do for that. So, um, I mean... I think academically they're still interesting, but from a practical point of view, I don't see a role. Okay. I think so the CT scans even more. Yeah, I'm going to come on CT. So bone marrow, <laughs> because there are a lot of trainees on this call. Yeah. Just remember, bone marrows are a bit uncomfortable. Yeah. And I think if you're doing a post-treatment assessment for MRD, you know, which we can debate separately, but just yeah. get a good aspirate straight into your flow cytometry tube. Yeah. And you don't do trephine biopsies, they are uncomfortable. None of us have had one. We we know that they can be uncomfortable. 
<laughs> oh, you're right. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I meant the clinicians on the call. We we love to send someone down to the day unit to have one. Anyway, so that's married. So CT. So Piers, I'm going to challenge you slightly on CT because if and I know there is a lot of pushback on doing scanning. Uh, if you're cynical, you say IWCLL has a heavy German influence, and when they do their ultrasounds in their private practice, but they don't all have access to CT, uh, which may have influenced some of the text there. So. When we look at all CLL data sets, we see a lot of recurrence of second cancer, debate about second cancers, not just skin cancer. Uh, CT is a screening tool, not just for CLL. When you are in your 70s, it's very hard to argue that there is a medical downside from a small bit of medical radiation from an intermittent scan. Um, yeah, I'll throw a different argument if in your 30s and 40s. But um, so do we not like CT scanning because it's just that we feel on principle is it a resource issue or do you think you can't think of occasions it's influenced your management of CLL well I'll take I'll go back on your one about another cancer if you ask for a CT scan from a radiologist to assess lymph node and spleen size because that's what you need for CLL if when it comes back and you review it and there was a bowel cancer missed on that scan because this has happened to me, actually. You know, the the argument from a radiologist was that that wasn't the right way to evaluate for a bowel cancer. You you want to do a dedicated, um, you know. So I was in a situation where a patient got serial scans, and it became quite odd because they were in a study. And we went back to the original scan, and it was there, but it wasn't reported because that wasn't the indication for the scan. So I think that's a real danger. From that, you don't agree with that argument, but I'm just giving well, you. I feel of... uncomfortable. Radio, a good radiologist look at the body on this. Anyway, we'll leave that. So you. No, 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 but no, but the point was made to me by extremely senior and experienced radiologist. That right. you know what you were looking for was for something else. You know, I think there's a tendency. I suppose what don't I like about scans? There's a tendency now in medicine to not think about why one is doing one. If you've got a good reason, of course. But in terms of assessing whether someone needs um what's wrong with the old-fashioned way of feeling for for nodes feeling for a spleen and putting that in the whole clinical picture mm. rather than oh, i'll just go for a scan and i'll talk about you in an mdm and mm. then we'll make a decision there without actually think i think that's what i don't like about that's why i don't like it. that's right you know I, you know what i'm like george i can be a little bit <laughs> no, I, I, I totally accept the point of view yeah. the vast majority of early stage CLLs, they probably don't need a scan. I'm always slightly jabby the other direction. I think about resources that influence how we practice. Um, yeah. But uh, I, the other thing I'd say about a scan is that we do, I mean, they are a useful marker, obviously, if you're in a trial, you're, they're an absolute objective marker. But again, in clinical practice, do the scan for the point that you need it. So for instance, some of the new regimes, with the venetoclax, you do need to know lymph node size to make a proper assessment about tumor lysis risk. But then do the scan perhaps in an appropriate time for that. For instance, you can be done between the obinutuzumab and that. Now, and we won't do that because we'll say logistically, oh, we'll never get the scan. So that you end up scanning someone uh, much earlier than perhaps, we, we, you know, and then actually inappropriately managing them as a consequence. So that's another thing just to say. Uh, anyway, I, I just... I, I suppose what I find is I'm finding increasingly in lymphoma practice, but I'm including CLL in that, that we end up scanning people and talking about people outside the context of a clinic consultation. And to go back to what we were saying earlier, the way I think the best way to assess symptoms is to meet people on multiple occasions. Yeah. Because yeah. that's, and it's change to me, which is what indicates to me is the way I try and gauge it. And I think, there, of course, there's a danger of you say you're asymptomatic or whatever, but I think I always try and catch that round and say, I cannot attribute the symptoms you're describing to me to progressive CLL, let's say. Now, I'm not 100% right, but I think that's the way to think about that. And I do, I am concerned. I, I mean, physician do no harm is the first rule of medicine. And um, and all of the treatments we give, even a calibrutinib, 
yeah, yeah. It's, it's it has for... got toxicities. And yes, they might the patient might well bounce back and say, I feel so much better. Equally, I, I've had patients come in and you're convinced they're going to be, you you know, you look at the parameters, you look at everything other than they come back a month later, it, even if, and, and they're worse. So. <laughs> yeah, but that's the, the, the joy of medicine fears is why yeah. we need us doctors, nurses, we need human beings, not computers to manage our patients. Well, I, I'm, well, I think that's what I'm saying. So anyway. <laughs> Um, right. So we we, we, all, we all say things which are, which the patient will hear in in a way we did not mean to say it, but I can and and that's what happened. So we're we're at the top of the hour. Um, Ros, before I'm just going to just check whether you want any points to feedback to close your session. But I'm just going to. There are four questions still in the thing. So after I brute and can we try try a color? I think we'll cover off the BTK questions after the therapy session because there's a lot there. Uh, do we still consider TP3 53 disruption? A poor prognosis in the era of modern drugs. Unfortunately, it probably still is a bit. Uh, obviously not as bad as it was. Questions about the low-level B symptoms we talked about. Then another question about fatigue. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Shah. This one is this patient long-term single agent ibrutinib. Uh, the fatigue persists. And that returns to Lilia's point that fatigue really can be extremely challenging. Um, uh, would you do CT scan to measure lymph node side? So Dr. Patti is asking that question and absolutely right. And I think that's what Piers was talking about, particularly using venetic lax. And I hear people saying in the relapsed setting, they're doing more CT scans. If the plan is the next to intervene before you have higher risk tumor lysis. 